One of the things I think a lot of people need to understand is we aren't a museum piece. The Inupiaq people are a living people and a living culture. Even though we're in northern Alaska, which covers this vast area from Nome all the way over the Canadian border, is that there is this extreme value of interconnectedness and interdependence. It's a hunting society, a gathering society, from thousands of years. This is what creates our culture. That special relationship between humans and the natural world and the animals, and that it teaches you how to have a, a society that doesn't do too much harm to the world. Love and respect for nature, for one another, for our elders, very, very fundamental value, key to, key to life. So our values are something that bind us all. The importance of sharing with one another, the importance of spirituality, and the connection to the land, our traditions, how we hunt, sharing of stories and songs and dances. I'm Inupiaq. I'm from the Arctic Ocean. Inupiaq Naruma. I am Inupiaq. It's very important to me. It's, it's who I am as a person. And we're very proud of who we are, and we want to continue that. It'd be busy, busy, busy all through the day. You get up and you just go right to work, you know, right to work. There was always something to do. There was never any idle time. The only idle time we had was after we eat and before we go to bed. One of the older people would just be just relaxing, laying down there and saying, you know, it'd be really nice to hear a story. And then just organically, someone would just start telling the story. Storytelling for the Nupiak people is very important because it not only created that sense of community, but is a way to pass on wisdom to the next generation. It was like TV, you know? <laughs> it was just like, it was as good as anything, any movie you've ever seen. And the storyteller told it so clearly that it was just as powerful as any of the greatest movie blockbusters you've ever seen. There was a reason behind the stories that we were told because they held traditional knowledge. They held things that we might need to know in life, whether it was about how to find food or how to survive, or it was about well-being and the importance of connecting with people and being a good member of the community. We all do stories. We all live in stories. We all tell stories to our friends and, and they need to be told. They need to be heard. So scrimshaw is this really beautiful method of art that's done either on baleen or ivory and traditionally it was used to tell stories. Each etching is telling a story of some event. Uh, caribou hunting was taking place. This is what was going on. War began around this time. And so it sort of gives you a timeline of history through etching. An elder or the person who carved it would literally be able to read the Scrimshaw story. They're like reading a book in a way. A lot of the storytelling traditions would be things that after the storytelling was done, we'd just rely on the next person telling it. And so scrimshaw is a very important way for Alaskan Native people to record their history. When I was growing up, uh, my grandpa uh, had a pet white fox. If you're a good friend with a fox, when there's danger abound, they try to keep you from getting into trouble. They pull tricks here and there, and foxes are uh, like uh, spoiled little kids in that way. When you let her out, she'd go 
prancing out in the snow, jumping in the air. I know she was happy then. Come running at me and jump on my chest, knock me backwards, lick my face, and, and I try not to let it. So that was my memory of my grandpa's pet. Caribou was, it, it provided for us in many ways. Our clothing in those days was made of all caribou skin. I grew up wearing caribou pants, mittens, caribou skin mattress, blankets. Some people had boots that were made with wolf leggings, sealskin sole bottoms. Berlin was shaved to make insoles. They kept us quite dry and warm as well. But the caribou skin clothing was the best. And we would get as many yearlings as we could for our outer clothing. And for a heavy winter, we would get caribou in February or March because the hair was the longest and the skin was the thickest. And we would use those for our winter gear. With that stuff on, you could sleep outside in 50 below and it wouldn't bother you a bit. Silla is the weather. It also means the atmosphere. Here's the Nuna, or the land. And it's anything from the land into the moon, the sun, the stars. That's Silla. It's, uh, it's a very spiritual, and we have a relationship with Silla. Uh, Silla has a soul in the same way we do as people, in the same way animals do. I think spirit helpers in and of themselves are really about how we're connected with things. And so it may be that there is a spirit helper that shows themselves as a bird to show you the way home. Or it may be a spirit helper that actually decides to show themselves with the face and body of a man instead of their animal form. And so I think one of the things that's hard to understand is that it's not one way of seeing things. It's one way of knowing you're connected to everything. We've always had that spirituality of everything around us. It's the interaction you have with the air you breathe, the, the ocean that you gather resources from, the rivers from which you gather fish, the tundra from which you pick berries, the animals that give themselves. It's, it's all of all of that. In the winter, when we were traveling, we didn't build sod houses, we built snow houses. In Canada, they call them igloo, but here in Alaska, we call them apuya. We do a day of travel, and then we'd make an apuya. The next day, my father would set traps, spend the day there, rest the dogs, give them something to eat, and then the following day, we continue to the next place. We'd go to my dad's sister, who had a house at the bottom. They had a small sod house over there. We didn't have to do anything. We just visit with them, and my dad and his sister were glad to see each other, and they'd talk away while kids played outside or go to sleep. By the time we get back to our home, my father would leave us with our aunt or with my grandmother. And then he'd start on his trips and go check his trap line. We were not into 8 to 5 kind of time, you know. We're in a totally different kind. We're in ecological time. Drum is something that's common to all cultures in Alaska. All cultures have a drum that may have some stylistic differences or differences in the materials that it's made, but it's still a recognition of life and vitality and the drum mirrors the heartbeat and when you continue drumming soon it will be in line with your heartbeat because that's what it's supposed to be the heartbeat of the community and it symbolizes vitality 
And it's, it's the most tremendous feeling to be in a room and to have one long row of all the drummers and to have that feeling of unity, everyone beating in harmony, the drum beat in unison, it's the most beautiful feeling. And to know that you're connected, you're on the land that you are connected to. And even if you grew up outside of the community, that which is in you comes from this area. And it's, it's the greatest feeling. Man, I went at it and look what happens. <laughs>They're just like other people. They just happen to be very small and extremely strong. These are stories that are common throughout Alaska. It's normally that people are in a size from your elbow to the tips of your fingers, and they possess superhuman strength. So they may be tiny, but they can carry a whole caribou. And if you go up north and you talk to a number of the people in the community, they'll talk about having seen the little people. There's a place at home that we know, but we don't profess it to anybody. But it's not like the boogeyman. They can be mischievous, they can be ornery, or they can be helpers. And every now and then, we might have the opportunity to see them, especially if they want us to see them. The fact that it's across Alaska really tells you something about our history and how we interacted with nature around us. The bola is what we call kilometown. And the kilometown is made out of braided sinew tied out to some heavy bone which you could twirl. In my case, we're catching ducks. When we're out uh, whaling, sometimes the ducks start flying. And they're good for duck hunting. You know, uh, if you're a whaling crew, you can't make too much noise, so you can't Use a shotgun for um, getting some duck soup handy, you know? So bolo was a really handy weapon to use for catching ducks. You know, the ducks fly in, you throw it up and tangles up the bird, and down they go. The scaredest I've ever been, I was 12 years old. We floated out on a piece of ice uh, while we were duck hunting. It was a bluebird day, just clear blue skies. And there was three of us, myself, my brother, and my dad. Next thing you know, we see this dark, dark shadow on the ice. Uh, we look and it goes behind us. So we, we all jumped up startled and uh, my dad, he started running. We got back to the ridge there. The, uh, the ice had fractured, cracked, and broke off and we were floating away. We were, we were drifting. <laughs> It was close enough to where my dad would have made it. He stopped and he thought about throwing us across and if one of us was on the other side, we would be split up. So he stopped and he just so happened to have a, a cell phone on him. 911 didn't pick up. <laughs> That's the worst feeling in the world right there. 911 did not pick up. So he left a, a message because they record their calls. Once he had relayed that information, his cell phone died. That was the scariest moment I've ever had in my life. We were floating away and I thought we were left for dead. Uh, he kept calm during this situation. Uh, he's bringing out everything positive in this case. You know, I'm crying, my brother's freaking out. It went from clear blue to dense, dense fog. Within a couple hours, we heard the chopper flying around, so they must have gotten our message. We thought we were saved, and then the chopper sound went away. So we lit some of the sled on fire. It's plastic. We thought black smoke in the fog would create some kind of marker. Chopper pilot uh, had mentioned 
uh, when we got rescued, you could see a glow in the fog. And he slowed down there, and sure enough, as soon as he slowed down, uh, we got within visual. That was definitely the scariest moment of my life, was floating away and not knowing what the outcome was going to be. We're very much aware of the climate change. And it's been for many years, even before climatologists were noticing the change, Inuit were already saying, Sila Alanoktok, our climate is changing. If the heat is going the way it is right now, for us it's going to be pretty bad. Different birds are coming, and they're coming earlier, and sometimes rain is more than what we want because when there's more rain, we know it's going to melt the permafrost. In my time as a young whaler, when I was nine years old, we're hunting from ice that was about 25 feet thick. And there was giant icebergs already floating, coming by. That was the first signs of a changing climate. Ice that never broke before was now moving. Now, here it is 50 years later, we're hunting whale from ice that's 18 inches thick. There's no more thick ice. It's creating a malfunction in our whaling season, is, is what it is. And actually, more than that, all seasons in general. I think we are more scientists than more people will realize. We have more knowledge of those things than people will ever know. <laughs> 